Hey there everyone, this is the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage and I'm coming back to you with another video as I was making the video on the tools used in sewing machine restoration and overhauls I mentioned to you that I wanted to do another video on the, the parts, the, the types of things that I like to keep um, on hand and as I was unpacking all of my parts stash I realized that I have so many that I wanted to divide it into two videos. Uh, so there are going to be uh, two concerning parts. One of them has to do with new parts, parts that you buy that are new and improved or they are reproduction parts. And fortunately there's quite a lot available out there. And then I'll make a separate video on vintage parts and why when you're overhauling machines, especially if you're going to do this as a hobby, that you would want to keep old parts uh, and keep some salvage because you'll need them and uh, vintage parts can be even better than some of the new parts in terms of quality. So I'm going to cover for you, uh, kind of go over, this is one of my boxes for parts um, and I typically purchase some of the things I like to keep on hand. These are things that are commonly, you're going to find that you will replace very often. These are of course bobbin winder tires. Uh, these are the little rubber rings or donuts people call them and they come in several sizes for the most part they come in small medium and large um, occasionally I have to order one special this is one that fits a vintage Bernina and it was unusually uh, large but most of them are not that size uh, another thing I keep of course are light bulbs this is um, actually this is one of the newer light bulbs it's an LED uh, light source but of course it has the uh, the socket not the socket it has the uh, the uh, the uh, plug end I guess you'd call for the lamp that fits traditional uh, sewing machine lights depending on which one it is I believe this is for a singer uh, I have this and then also you can I can also get the traditional ones here's the traditional incandescent uh, bulb or version of that same bulb and sometimes when I get them I buy them in mass I bought a whole package these are not bobbins they were pack packed here and I get quite a few of them because light bulbs are things that typically either they get damaged or they will um, they will you know they'll burn out over time and it's nice to have those on hand so you can get on with the business of what you're trying to do let's see uh, these are low shank feet. Now, very often sewing machines come with feet and you, you, you many times will see the vintage versions of the feet which are wonderful. These are low shank. These are probably the most common of the shanks. The, the shank uh, of the foot of course being this part right here. This part. And uh, uh, this, these are low shank and these are all zigzag feet I happen to have here and you can get these in normally in most sewing shops uh, let's see and both of these bags here these are motor brushes and I also keep springs in this case you'll see uh, I ordered these and these are motor brushes that came with the springs I believe these are for a singer perhaps uh, you can get brushes for almost any of the vintage sewing motors and I think that's kind of cool that after all these years you can still get the brushes for those things. Uh, some of your machine restoration will require the use of grommets. Now rubber grommets are things you can get in traditional hardware stores. You can also order these online and these are very helpful when you are um, working on especially Singer potted motors, direct drive motors. Many of these have rubber grommets and they were used so that the electrical cords could pass through them and not, excuse me, not touch the metal of the sewing machine body. And over time they dry rot and they need to be replaced. They're very inexpensive and you can still get them. Let's see, what else have I got here? I have uh, sewing machine pins, spool pins. Sometimes you get an old machine and the spool pins are broken or they're gone. They've disappeared. Who knows what's happened to them? You may have to uh, take out the remnants of broken pins. Here's one. Uh, you can even get replacements for Singer 500 series, the Rocketeer, as many of you know it. Sometimes these have broken. You can get those. 
And of course, they also come in metal. You can get them typically for Kenmore machines, um, as well as Singer machines. Very easy to find, not very expensive. Uh, let's see. What else have I got here? <clears throat> oh, I have wicking. Uh, later on, when you guys see uh, the videos I'm going to produce on how to service vintage sewing machine motors, uh, you can get various kinds of wicks. Now, not all motors use these, but some of them, the, the potted motors of the Singer certainly, and also the Kenmore and White Rotaries, they have bearings that use a wick and then you, uh, you apply grease to the bearing and then the wick helps keep the grease flowing to the bearing. Uh, very inexpensive. I get this on, on, on the internet and there are ways to cut it and trim it. We'll be going over that when I start talking about the motors, but that's something I like to have uh, on hand. And of course needles, you always want to replace the needle on uh, machines that you're restoring. Uh, as I have mentioned before to you, uh, to you folks, the Organ brand is my favorite brand of needle. These are, most of them are made in Japan. Uh, they also have a titanium coated version that are the best quality I have found. Uh, a more common one that you can find in a sewing shop, there's certainly nothing wrong with these. These are the Schmetz brand. Uh, they used to be made in Germany. They are now made uh, either in Mexico or Asia, I believe. And Schmetz is still a good brand. It, it makes a good sewing needle. They, they are typically, uh, you can get them in regular, you can get them in jeans needles for heavy fabrics and also leather tips. So that's another uh, brand I have. Now Singer, uh, the Singer brand needles are not required for most Singer machines. There's nothing wrong with them per, per se, but I always keep a, a little variety pack of Singer brand sewing needles. And there's a reason for this. For reasons I can't fully explain, because I don't know why this is, but on certain Singer sewing machines, especially Singer featherweights, they sometimes will balk at different brands of sewing needles. And I have had featherweights before that did not want to sew with other brands of needles, but they would take the Singer. And, and I don't know if it has to do with the length of the needle being slightly off. We're talking about fractions here. But anyway, I have found this to be a solution, and you may have noted that on online uh, when you've gone online and done some research. Now this little device is, is interesting. This is an adapter for uh, sewing feet. Sometimes you'll get a sewing machine that will have a high shank foot and you want to use low shank and you don't want to go out and buy a bunch of different feet. If you have low shank feet, you attach this to, um, uh, you attach this to the presser foot and then uh, you use a screw to attach the uh, low shank foot. So it basically acts as an extension. Very nice little tool to have. Uh, I have gotten these online, they're not expensive, and I try to keep at least one or two uh, on handy. Now these are, these are something you, you might not have thought of before, and I had until I was online at one of, the, one of my suppliers, so classic, and I get these. These are decals. Some of the vintage, many of the vintage sewing machines uh, before the 1950s did not have seam guide or measurement marks on the needle plate and you had, you had seam guide uh, uh, brackets that you, could, that you could screw onto the bed of the machine. But this is nice to have. And if, uh, if you are overhauling a machine for someone or for yourself and, and you think, gosh, I sure would like to have this, these are little decals and they fit right onto the, uh, uh, onto the needle plate. And they're, they're very useful, I find, for some people who want them. Now, these are Class 15 bobbin cases, and this one particularly is for a white sewing machine. I'm going to be doing another video on a white sewing machine that I rescued and almost did not save, and I'll, I'll tell the story of that when I, when I do that video. But you can get new reproduction bobbin cases for lots of the vintage machines, including um, including uh, class 15 Japanese made machines, which is what that, that white machine is. And going over, this collection of new parts would not be complete without mentioning to you about belts. Now, when you go to buy replacement belts, you can get 
uh, belts that are made of the traditional rubber. They look and kind of feel like the old style car fan belts, but of course they're for sewing machine motors. And they have, the traditional ones have, see if this will pick up on the camera, kind of a V-shape underneath, the part that touches the pulley. And sometimes with certain singers, uh, you will want this shape. Um, whenever I restore a Singer Featherweight, I will often use these just because I think they're, uh, you know, just for historical reasons. You can get brand new uh, black rubber V-belt, or they're called V-groove, uh, sort of a V-shape, if you will, uh, to fit the, uh, the groove of the pulley. But for uh, other times, I simply use what are called lugged belts, L-U-G-G-E-D. And they have little ridges on them. Some people believe they give you better, uh, better traction on your belt and don't slip as much. That may or may not be true, but they're very strong. And, uh, and of course, you can see I have them in different sizes. You'll always want to check uh, with the place. Often the place that sells the belts can tell you, hopefully, uh, what size belt fits your machine. Because if the belt doesn't fit, yes, you can adjust some sewing machine motors up to a point. But after that, uh, you, you're going to need uh, the, the right size belt or certainly something close to it. Now, the other video I'll be making, I'll be talking a lot about vintage parts and why I keep them. I put these, this in here, though. These are old belts that I took off of a vintage Husqvarna C21 uh, free arm machine. And the reason I kept these is I'm not going to reuse them because they're they're older and I like to put new belts on the machines I restore if they don't have new belts. But I save these because sometimes if you have a machine where the specifications are not uh, readily found online or they're kind of a pain to find, it's nice to keep these because if you have another machine in the future and you want to replace the belts, if you can't remember what size, you keep the old ones and then you you know, you, you make a mark and then you, uh, you roll around and then you measure the length of the belt. And that's useful. That, that just helps me keep up with when I'm trying to order stuff. Uh, cords. There are certain cords that I like to keep on hand, particularly for singers. I restore lots of singers, as you guys have seen. Uh, one of the most common of the singer cords is this one. And it has kind of a, kind of a slight... Uh, uh, arch, if you will. Sometimes it, it goes in with the arch uh, arcing downward and sometimes upward, depending on the machine. But this is what's called a dual lead. It has a cord that goes into both ends. You can get these readily online. And then, oh, that's an extra cord. And then you can also get what's called, there's another double, let's see. You can get what's called a single lead. And of course, this one has one cord on the end and then none, none on this end. It depends on the machine and the foot pedal setup that you have. And let's see, I have another cord here. And this is typically, those of you, if you can see through the plastic there, guys, this is one of those cords that has that double outlet um, and it has both a motor side and a light side. And when you plug those in, you want to make sure that the plug from the light is going into the one that says light. They are specific. But anyway, you can easily get these. So if you've got an old machine and it's got one of these cords and it's looking kind of rough, you can get them. And like I say, none of these cords are particularly expensive. And this one fits many of the vintage Neckies. And it also fits the FAF machines. It's kind of an oval shape uh, to it. And... Uh, it has, it's got uh, cords coming out each end. And again, it's nice to have these uh, when you really, you just really want to get the cord replaced. I also keep uh, foot pedals. Now, when I do the video on the vintage parts, I'll talk a lot about which foot pedals I restore and which ones I keep parts for and which ones I don't. Uh, this is my favorite <clears throat> replacement pedal. Some of my customers they don't necessarily want to use the vintage pedal, mostly because of how they work. I'd say about half. Half of my customers really love the old button style Singer uh, pedals. Those are the, the only ones I, I do restorations on. And then others prefer something more modern, which in this case is, you know, this is just like a uh, accelerator uh, in a car. You know, you put your foot on it and you press down. 
These are electronic and I get these from SoClassic.com and the reason I like these is they have uh, up to a 1.2 amp capacity and they have a UL sticker on them. So they're, they're, uh, they are, have passed a, a UL or Underwriters Laboratory inspection, which is kind of nice. Uh, these are made in Taiwan. A lot of electrical parts you get today for all sorts of things can be made in other countries. I do, you don't always get the UL designation, but it sure is nice to have. Uh, I told you guys earlier that I had uh, uh, heat shrink. This is really, probably comes into the tool department, but I found this as I was going through my stuff. And uh, anyway, this is what the heat shrink looks like, guys. It looks like long tubes of, of, uh, sort of a pliable, rubbery polymer. And uh, anyway, that's for when you're making repairs to electrical cords. Let's see. Oh, this is something I found. I think I got this at Etsy, actually. And this is wool. <clears throat> now, for Singer 66 models, uh, and that goes all the way back to the old Red Eye Treadle 66s and even the more modern, modern, the later uh, electric powered Singer 66, Singer 99, and the Singer 185 models, all of them have a wick, a little uh, red wick that sits down in the shuttle. And that wick is there. People, some people mistakenly rip it out thinking it's lint or fabric, but no, it's supposed to be there. Those machines had an oiling wick and it was bright red on purpose so that hopefully people would, uh, would leave it alone. But I have actually gone and purchased, uh, this is merino wool of all things, uh, in the original Singer red color. And then I cut and I, when I restore 66 uh, and the 99 and the 185s, I often have to replace. Sometimes that wick is missing or sometimes it's kind of tired or frayed and I replace them. And I may do a video on that at some point because that's that's something you really want that machine to have. Uh, and I was really fortunate. I, it took me a while to find just the right uh, thickness, but I'll do a video that's on, the, on that that is separate. And let's see, what else have we got here? Uh, last but not least, you can get hooks. You may find that sometimes you get a machine, and this is this is the hook on a class 15 machine, and the hook's not there. Uh, sometimes people sell machines that they don't know much about sewing machines, and this could be missing and they don't even know, right? They'll plug it in and it'll spin, and uh, they may miss the bobbin case, the bobbins, but they don't know, right? Uh, many people do this just it's, it's an innocent uh, uh, mistake on their part. But anyway, you can get hooks. I think I ordered this. This is a class 15 hook. I don't remember which machine I ordered it for, but ended up find, finding that I had another one. But you can get these, and they're pretty, pretty high quality. Now, I have been increasingly working on restoring treadle sewing machines. Any of you who have received a treadle machine, uh, you may find that uh, very often, the old belts, which are made of leather, they're sort of a round, uh, sort of rod-shaped uh, leather belts, um, sort of shaped like a straw, and you can get replacements. Now, this one came uh, with a machine that I got. Normally, I order it on large rolls because I, I restore quite a few machines. You don't have to order it in that size. But you can get this. Uh, believe it or not, here's, here's some of those left of a roll I had. And it's basically made of rawhide leather. And uh, I'll do a separate video on how you, you go through the process of uh, replacing and installing a new leather treadle belt. You may find other people who've done those uh, videos. But the great thing is you can still get leather belting for treadle sewing machines. Some of these machines were made 150 years ago, but you can still get the, uh, the, the belt material. And they're not, it's not particularly expensive. You should get and make sure that you receive uh, with your treadle leather belt, you're gonna want these little hooks. And these are treadle belt hooks. And they look like little links of chain. And what happens is you, there's a bunch of them in this bag, guys, but this is just, you'll take one of these and you're gonna put holes in the belt and you're going to uh, connect the two ends of the belt together when you're finished. And that's how you, you uh, install treadle belts. And I'll, I'll do a video further on that. Let's see, I also keep 
Uh, this is extra cord. I think this may be just a, you know, a two wire cord, which many of my vintage machines use. And uh, I lot, a lot of times I like to keep extra cord on hand um, uh, just in case. Uh, oh, here's, a, here's another cord, by the way, that Necky and Pfaff, the German and Italian machines often use this. You can also get the single lead. Uh, there are reasons why you want uh, a single lead or one cord on the end, and sometimes you want two. And again, that has to do with how your machine was set up. Um, with its foot controller. And, and the setups are a little different, and when they're different, that determines what kind of cord that you might want to order. The best way to know that is if you have the original cord, get a cord that, that, that is comparable to the original one that you have. And so that's it, guys. That is essentially just a quick rundown of some of the things that I try to keep on hand. I, sometimes I run out of stuff. If you are wanting to restore one machine or a specific machine, you don't, um, you don't have to uh, uh, keep all of this stuff on hand. Again, I restore machines as a hobby. I've been doing it quite a long time, and I've discovered that these are certain types of things that I want to keep on hand when I can. If not, I'm going to have to stop the restoration and then pick up when I get the part in, and that happens occasionally, but no big deal. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to share that with you so that you could see some of the things that are available to you. And it might surprise you just how many um, parts that you can get that are reproduction, uh, particularly the cores and the soft parts. Because of all the things that, that, that exist on a vintage sewing machine in terms of parts, I would say that it's maybe less than 20% of the time do I have a broken part. Sometimes the spring in a bobbin case, an old bobbin case, will have broken. Sometimes it's because it got, you know, it got stiff from not being used, and then someone, someone broke it when they went to use it. You can get those replaced. Um, but it's normally the soft parts, you know, the cords, electrical cords and, and bobbin winding tires, uh, those rubber grommets, you know, rubber and, and vinyl, uh, they only last so long, and so it's so nice to know that you can go online and get some of these parts. Now, some parts are not as always as easy to find, but uh, and we'll talk more in a future video about brands of vintage sewing machines and which ones are a little easier to get parts for. But for today, I just wanted to share this with you. Uh, been I'm still working on uploading my uh, my my video about sewing tools, but. Uh, I'm going to kind of do a pan here, let you see this big pile. So these are, uh, this giant pile is, is uh, all of the stuff I just kind of went over with all of you and showed to you. But it's great to know that this stuff is out there. Once I get this video uploaded, I'll try to put down a, a list of places, because I promised that in the prior video, places that you can buy some of these things. You don't have to, that you have a lot of choices, but I'll show you some of the places I have ordered from before, places I've been happy with. And again, the vast majority of all of the stuff you see here was not overly expensive. Once you get into restoring some of the European brand sewing machines and you get into machines from going into the 60s with the first electronic pedals, you will start to see the prices go up. But for most of the machines you folks are going to be restoring, I have never had to pay you know, many of these belts, they range anywhere from six to eight dollars. And, and these are parts that, that last many, many years. And so, um, let's see, one thing I just realized I wanted to include in this video and may have not, I'm promising you folks that I am going to be doing videos on those rotary machines. And I wanted to show these to you. These are those rubber friction drive or rubber motor pulleys that those uh, that those rotary machines use. Now this one, they come in essentially two sizes, right? How do you know which size? You want to look at the size or the, the, uh, the circumference, the diameter, <laughs> not the circumference, sorry, the diameter of the shaft on your motor because this one, this one here in my right hand is, is smaller around and it's a smaller pulley. So installing these is very simple. I'll do, I'm going to do a video soon and I'll show it to you all. Uh, those rotary machine motors are pretty simple to service. You, you might be surprised. They're easy to access. One of, 
one of the, they're almost a pleasure to work on. But anyway, some, many of you have asked me because some of those machines, you know, they would sit for years and they get either dry rotted or they get um, bald flat spots on them. And you can get these. And folks, I think I paid three, between three and four dollars a pop for these. Okay. And these are pretty good quality. I like the rubber on these. They're they're still soft enough. They're new, so they're pretty firm, but they're soft enough to give you the friction that you need. And so, uh, again, I'm going to put some links uh, on the video description so you guys can see where I'm getting some of these things. But I, like I said, most, and I tell my customers this, when I charge for restoring or overhauling a vintage sewing machine, the vast majority of cost is labor because I spend many hours working on them. The parts for largely speaking okay there are always going to be exceptions to this but but on the whole you really aren't going to pay a ton of money for replacement parts and that's the great thing when you need a part it's not often you need one you might restore a vintage sewing machine and not need any new parts so don't don't assume you're going to have to buy any parts much less all of this stuff remember i do this as a hobby so for those of you watching if you're wanting to get into the hobby of vintage sewing machines these are some of the things you might find useful to keep on hand. You don't have to have this many belts initially. You can start, start small. Decide which brands and which models you might want to work on. I work on most all of them now. And for those of you who simply want to keep a machine in your family, you want to make it work, or maybe you just came across a machine and you're interested in sewing, at least you know if you need any of these parts, you'll know where to get them. You won't, you won't need nearly uh, uh, the inventory of stuff that you see here, right? You don't need all those light bulbs. I do. But it's kind of nice to know where to find them, right? Uh, one last thing to mention to you. I've mentioned it to you all before. If you are missing the original user's manual for your sewing machine, many of those are available on the internet. If it's a Singer manual, almost all of them are free. You can Google or do, do a search that says, um, you know, Singer sewing machine manuals PDF. And if you know the, the, the model number of your machine, that'll certainly help with your search. And you will find them. And there, there are many places that you can go to get them. For other machines, do a search online. You may find a free PDF. And there are also websites where they sell PDFs of these. Or you can go on eBay. You may even, you may even find, you know, a vintage uh, like this one. I'm going to be putting in the next video that I do on vintage sewing machine parts. Um, this is one for an old 201 that I have. But you don't have to get an original. You can search for one. You might want one. But there's there are PDFs of these to be had. And if you need one for sometimes a Kenmore machine or a Necky machine, you may find them free. But even if you have to buy them. They sell online. People will sell the PDFs for $5, $6. You know, they're not outrageous. None of this stuff is really outrageous, guys. And that's one of the things I, I really love uh, about this hobby is that I have access to the parts that I need most of the time. And uh, again, when I uh, have my clients come and get a machine from me or they bring one of their machines for me to restore, I, you know, this is why when you see my machines posted, you'll see them on Craigslist, you see the 24 photos I put. And then, of course, I make videos of how the machines run and I tell the stories of the machines. That's how my channel was created in, uh, originally. That was the original inspiration for the channel was so that people could see, um, they could see, you know, all the work that went into restoring them. And that's really... Uh, where most of the cost is. And so if you want to work on your own machine, you, you know, you have this, the cost of a few parts and that's only if you need them. But anyway, this uh, is the second video in terms of focusing on the hobby. The last video I just made, and I'm still waiting for it to upload, is the video on tools that a sewing machine restoration or overhaul might require, whether you're a hobbyist or whether you are a, uh, a person with a machine that you want to fix up. This video is on new sewing machine parts, the ones I keep, the ones you could possibly want to po uh, have access to. And then I'm going to have to do a third video, which is on sewing machine vintage parts. I have so many parts, guys. I didn't want to cram all of that into one video. But uh, I sure appreciate all of you watching. You've all been great. And any comments you have, any questions you have about, um, about parts, 
generally or, or a specific question, or maybe you have a comment, maybe you have something to share or something you would like to add. Maybe there are, there's something not here that you, that you think should be. Please let me know and uh, I will start to get to work on the vintage sewing machine part video. And I really appreciate all of you watching and, uh, and sharing your comments with me. Thanks so much.